Greetings, and thank you all for joining us today. Today, on the day of our broadcast, is a very gloomy, gray, rainy autumn afternoon. Maybe perfect for our topic today, predatory plants. Thanks for taking some time out of your life to join us for one of our live webinars. They will be recorded, so you can refer back anytime that you'd like, uh, and find other recordings of other webinars of various topics that relate to natural history and the environment. My name is James Stevenson, and I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the Extension Service. We are an extension of the University of Florida right here in Pinellas County. I'm physically coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve which is one of very few places left in our very urbanized county where you can come and meet some of these predatory plants, some of these meat-eating plants. Now, as you know, if you've had, uh, if you've ever attended one of these, you do have a small um, dashboard where you are able to communicate with me and with Julia, who is running our behind the scenes, a much more difficult job than presenting. If you need to, if you have any technical issues or have any questions that have to do with programming here at Brooker Creek, uh, do contact Julia using the chat function. And if you have any questions for me, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting those in the queue and A, and I'll keep monitoring the Q and A throughout. Uh, if I don't get to the questions during the presentation, I'll certainly mop them up at the end. So that's how we'll proceed today. I hope that suits everyone. And let's go ahead and get started with this um, possibly gruesome topic of the predatory plants. Now, everyone thinks that we're going to start, or when you think about meat eating plants, that we're going to get into something like this, right? Everyone's heard of the Venus flytrap. This is a uh, a plant that the uninitiated are certainly aware of. And the Venus flytrap is not found in Pinellas County. It is found in Florida. It has escaped from cultivation. Terrifying. Uh, naturally, its distribution is in North and South Carolina. This is a plant that's often sold as this meat-eating plant, and it you have to feed it hamburger to keep it happy. Lots of mythology surrounding these plants. So let's see if we can bust some of those myths and boost some of the truths of this fascinating group of plants. Now, if you sat with me before, you know I like to start with a big kind of overview before we get into the granular bits. So we're going to look at plants in general, and then how did this habit of carnivory suddenly appear in several groups of plants different at different times? Not all carnivorous plants are related to each other. This habit popped up several times. And the why of carnivory, why did plants develop this ability. It wasn't innate. The very first plants on land were not adapted as carnivores. This happened later. This developed. We'll look at some of the species you can find in Pinellas and very close to Pinellas. You know, plants do not respect political, geographical uh, borders. And so there are some, uh, one group of these carnivorous plants that aren't found in Pinellas, but they're right next door, how they work and, you know, what do they get on with eating? So again, we'll go ahead and proceed and with the plants. Like I said, we're going to start with plants in general. Now, this, of course, is a sunflower, not a carnivorous plant. Plants are very intimately associated with insects. We all know that. Plants depend, most plants depend on insects for pollination and they'll actually attract insects to their flowers using 
showy petals, bright colors, a nectar reward, attracting insects to take their pollen and be messengers and move through the air, which only insects were ever able to do. Originally, it was the insects that were the, the uh, animals in the air. But, you know, plants don't want to invite all the insects because some insects are going to come in and start chewing on the leaves or eating the flowers, which, of course, is no great thing. So this relationship that plants have with insects is kind of give and take. So let's take a look at some of the plants that we have here in Central Florida writ large. We've got our oak hammock habitat. This is a photograph taken here at Brooker Creek, and you can see a mixture of different plants and plant lifestyles, if you will. We have trees. Trees are those robust plants that are able to make wood out of a special carbohydrate called lignin, a very tough, um, very difficult to digest. Lignin actually sat around for millions and millions of years and ended up as coal because nothing knew how to break it down. There was nothing around, like now we have fungus and bacteria that have adapted the ability to break down lignin. So these giant plants developed the ability to get very tall, get their leaves way up into the sunlight. And those are the plants that we know as trees. Underneath the trees, we have this understory, the lower growing plants that take advantage of the filtered light that can come through the overstory. We also have in this photograph a different lifestyle, a plant, a flowering plant with a different lifestyle, the Spanish moss that's hanging on the branches of this tree. Now, the Spanish moss is not a parasite. It's not getting anything from the tree that it's living on. It's just making its own food as plants do. It's just hanging there in the sun. It's taking advantage. The trees are anchored in the soil and they can draw water out of the soil but they get the bulk of their body mass from the carbon that they take from the air and make them into those carbohydrates that plants are made of. And the saw palmettos, they're doing their own thing in the understory with their broad leaves that can absorb all that sunlight. So all this is in balance. And what the plants are doing, as I mentioned, is they're, the plants are taking sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and so fizzy water and breaking the components apart, taking the hydrogen from water and the carbon from carbon dioxide and turning them into sugar. And the byproduct of course is oxygen that's responsible now for the air that we breathe. It's a pretty good setup and we're obviously um, used to it and we're obviously dependent on it. So what, plant take, what plants take from the environment are the light that they use for the photosynthetic reaction, the carbon dioxide, which is one of the components, water is the other, that are then rearranged to form the carbon dioxide, and certain chemicals that are found in the soil. In plant science, these are referred to as nutrients. Um, not food per se, but nutrients. And plants depend on certain nutrients that they usually get from the soil more than others. These are the macronutrients that are usually the, the, these nutrients, these chemicals that are found in fertilizers. These are applied to plants to um, encourage more robust growth. These are chemicals, these are elements that are found quite abundantly in the environment. So they don't need supplemental fertilizing the big macronutrients, N, P, and K, the ones that fertilizers are formulated to contain, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There's some other macronutrients. And then there's micronutrients that plants use for various um, uh, synthesis, synth synthesis processes. Um, these are the micronutrients that are used in, you know, obviously smaller amounts uh, for various biological um functions within the plant. These are the micronutrients. And you can see a list of those elements here. So that's how plants kind of exist in the wild. But that the, the most macro of all the macronutrients is nitrogen. And 
just like there's a water cycle where water falls as rain and sinks into the soil and evaporates as a gas and then condenses and falls back down as rain and cycle, nitrogen cycles its way through a balanced um, ecosystem as well. There's a nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen exists as a gas in our atmosphere, quite a lot of our atmosphere. In fact, the majority of our, of our atmosphere is nitrogen, atmospheric gas. Not available to plants though. Plants can't take nitrogen from the atmosphere the way they can take carbon dioxide and use it. They can't use the, the nitrogen from the atmosphere. The nitrogen has to be fixed, fixed into a form that is available to the plants. And this has to happen or the plant doesn't get this major macronutrient. Now, the way that atmospheric nitrogen is fixed into a form that is available to the plants is through the activity of nitrogen fixing bacteria. They can do this, they do this, and it benefits the plants. The plants take advantage of it. Now, the nitrogen don't do it for the plants, but plants have evolved the ability to take that nitrogen that is fixed by the bacteria and use it to build their tissues. Now, this semi-complicated diagram here kind of shows that where you've got the atmospheric nitrogen on the top, let's head to the left, uh, where and then down with the nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the nodules of certain roots of like the legumes gets fixed and then the legume can take it up. Other nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil can change the, um, the nitrogen into an ammonia, which is then further nitrified into the nitrites, nitrates that are available to the plant. You see how these are all kind of handed back and forth. I never really got it. I don't really memorize it. I just know that it happens and I'm really glad that someone's got it figured out. But anyway, and when the plants die or when animals that have processed plant matter defecate or when they die, we've got organisms that are decomposers that can take all these apart and decompose and take the nitrogen bearing compounds apart. Those are the decomposers. So this is the kind of cycle where nitrogen goes through an ecosystem. And in a perfect world, it's all balanced. But in some circumstances, nutrients can be limited in the soil there might be something out of whack with that whole cycle that prevents the soil, the nitrogen fixing bacteria from functioning as well as they could. Usually when environmental, environmental conditions aren't perfect, that kind of limits the ability of those bacteria to get to work and do what they need to do. And it could also limit the ability of the decomposers to do what they need to do. And so plants that, it, that choose to live in these environments where the nutrients are limited have to adapt. The real estate is there, but the nutrients are limited. So if you want to move into the real estate, you need to adapt. And plants are very, very good at adapting. Very good at adapting. Synthesizing things, adapting, changing, mutating. Plants have tried everything and plants have been obviously very successful on earth because they've managed to get everywhere. And plants live places where almost nothing else can live. I mean, who, who in their right mind would adapt to live in an environment where you're covered by snow for nine months of the year? Well, plants. Also, plants have to deal with the competition with other species. So to succeed in an environment, in an ecosystem, 
the adaptations have to allow for the lack of nutrients and they also have to give a competitive advantage to anything, any other plant that might be trying to muscle in on this turf. Does that make sense? So we've got competition for resources and we also have the limited, the limited resources. So, you know, it's a knife edge living in certain environments. One of these adaptations to living in a certain set of environmental circumstances to give plants an advantage and a boost in the competition is carnivory. And this solution to eat animals, the solution to the limited resources and the solution to how am I going to compete with my neighbors in this nutrient limited environment, this carnivorous lifestyle has popped up about nine different times as an experiment that worked. It's an example of what is referred to as convergent evolution, where a solution to a problem is uh, arrived through mutation and selection by two very different organisms. The classic example that is given, it wasn't given when I was a kid, but it's given now and it's great, is to compare the bodies of a shark, yes, like shark in the ocean shark, and dolphin, yeah, like dolphin in the water. So they have, if you look at them, they have very similar body shapes, sizes, coloration. Uh, they both have dorsal fins and pectoral fins and tail fins. That body plan is so effective at hunting in the water that that body plan has been developed independently in two very different groups of organisms, the cartilaginous fishes and the mammals. So that's another example. That is the classic example of convergent evolution. We see it a lot in plants and carnivory is one of these examples where different groups of plants have developed the ability to eat or take nutrient, nutrient that's limited in the environment from animals. Now the habitats where this is crucial are in habitats where nitrogen and phosphorus are the limited nutrients. And to be considered in the carnivorous club, the carnivore club, to be considered a carnivorous plant, certain um, criteria need to be met. The plant must have the ability to absorb these limited nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus in particular, from the surface or from the interior of the plant. We're not talking about plants that can take fixed nitrogen from the soil through the roots. That would be normal for plants in the environment to get fixed nitrogen through their roots. That's if there's plenty of nitrogen available. But when the nitrogen is not available, and these carnivorous plants have evolved, they take the nitrogen through the surface of their bodies, not through their roots. And also to be considered carnivorous, there has to be a clear adaptation to lure, catch, and digest the prey. So those are the criteria for plants to be considered carnivorous. Now in Pinellas, does that make sense? I think that should make sense. So in Pinellas, we have a couple of different groups of carnivorous plants. We have a group that are called the sundews. We have a group that are called the butterworts. We have several species of butterwort. We have a few different species of bladderwort. And there's one pitcher plant that's almost found in Pinellas County. It used to be found in Pinellas County, but it through habitat loss and development, we just, it got extirpated is what's called. It got kicked out. 
It's not found in Pinellas anymore, but it's right across the border in Hillsborough County. If you want to visit pitcher plants in the wild, go to the Brooker Creek Headwaters. Not Brooker Creek Preserve, but the Brooker Creek Headwaters. That's just across the county line in Hillsborough County. And you can see the one species of pitcher plant that we have in this part of Florida here. There are more species of pitcher plants, the Saracenia group in the panhandle of Florida, rich diversity there. And further in the southeast, even up into the mountains, there are a few mountain species of pitcher plant. They all live in these areas where nitrogen is a limited, a limiting factor in limited amounts. So let's take a look at some of our environments where nutrients are limited. That would be our freshwater wetlands. Stagnant water can produce, does produce conditions that are a bit tricky to survive in. And our freshwater wetlands, classic example of fresh water that sits. These areas tend to be very acidic. And the acidity can lead to a um, lack of available nitrogen in the soil. It can also limit the ability of the decomposers to do their work. So the decomposers, the fungus and the bacteria that can break complex meat into its component parts, amino acids and, and eventually nitrogens, their work is hindered. You might have heard of um, bog people that were thrown into peat bog, you know, maybe hung and then thrown into peat bogs and we find them thousands of years later and they're perfectly preserved. That's because of the, 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 the very acidic conditions that limit the um, activity of the decomposers in those very acidic places. So we have plenty of acidic, stagnant, nutrient limited areas here in a freshwater wetland. And the plants, the carnivorous plants that we find associated with these freshwater wetlands include the carnivores, the sundew group. And we have two species of sundew here in Pinellas County. Um, they look very similar. It's not, um, it's not hard to confuse the two. And it's also not hard to identify them as being sundews. They have very characteristic leaves that are paddle shaped and covered in these hairs, specialized hairs. Now, hairs on leaves shouldn't be too hard to imagine. We've all perhaps felt the fuzzy leaves of lamb's ear or the underside of um, magnolia leaves is covered in hairs. Hairy leaves is not something that's too hard to imagine. It's the specialized hairs on the surface of the sundews that are tipped with glands that secrete this very sticky, viscous liquid that is the trap. So it's these glandular hairs on the surface of the leaves of the sundews that do the work. Now, where the conditions are good for sundews and bright, bright, hot, blazing sunlight, a damp, if not wet, soil. Not a lot of competition because not many other plants can stand these conditions. Very acidic, very wet, with nitrogen being very limited. So they don't really have many competitors. And here's a typical patch of sundews here at Brooker Creek. They grow pretty densely. They only have each other to compete with. And if they're all genetically related, as long as somebody produces seed, it's good for the entire population. Now, how do they produce seeds? How are they going to produce seeds? Well, they're going to flower. They're flowering plants. So they have their traps 
Down at the bottom, you can see the leaves here, these paddle-shaped leaves with the glandular tipped hairs. It even looks like there's a little victim in this one here. And eventually it's gonna come time to reproduce. So the plant will produce a flowering stem right out of the center of the leaves. And it will reach way up into the air and produce, you know, seven to 10 flowers, event, you know, one at a time as it uncurls, pink or white flowers. But it puts its flowers way far away from its traps. Because although it's luring insects to the glistening glandular hairs, it's luring in small flies, gnats, some of our smaller bee species, perhaps predatory bees that might see something stuck on the trap and then they go to eat it and themselves get stuck. So the traps are doing all that attracting, but they don't want to eat their pollinators. So they put their flowers way up out of the way so as not to eat the pollinators. Eventually the flowers are visited by small native bees that completely avoid the traps. So they don't get eaten. They can fly off with the with the pollen, fertilize another plant and go about their business. Meanwhile, on the ground, the, those paddle-shaped sticky traps are busy collecting the living creatures, which don't live for very long once they hit the traps. Here's another, for scale, a, a, a normal sized human visiting what we call Sundew City out here at Brooker. And seasonally, these come and go. When the conditions are just right, the leaves are at their largest, their most productive. And then when conditions aren't so great, they have the ca capacity to kind of go into a resting stage, the sundews. Now, there is a trade-off. Here we have those paddles being produced. These leaves, they are leaves. They're modified leaves. All the carnivorous plants that we're looking at today are carnivorous through their leaf modifications. And here you can see where those glandular hairs have bent towards the prey and they're surrounding it. And they're slowly breaking down those uh, carbohydrate, the, the protein, excuse me, the protein exoskeleton and eventually the nice proteinaceous hemolymph or guts of the insect that lands and is then absorbed through the leaf surface. However, all these traps, the leaf is almost completely given over to traps. Far less photosynthesis is going on than would be going on if these leaves were larger and greener. Do you know what I mean? So there's a little bit of a trade-off. Yes, we're, make, we're getting our supplemental nitrogen, but there's this balance, this trade-off with how much photosynthesis is lost as a result of turning the leaf from a sugar factory into a nitrogen capturing device. You see what I mean? So these plants really don't get that big here in our part of Florida. These sundews, an entire plant would fit quite comfortably on your thumbnail. The trap type for the sundews is referred to as a flypaper. Literally, if you've ever seen flypaper or the fly strips, they're just sticky. So those glandular hairs produce a viscous, sticky substance that the animals get trapped in. And eventually, uh, through the action of some enzymes, are decomposed, taken apart to their constituent parts. Another, so that's the sundews. And like I said, we have two species here. The butterworts are a different group. And this is a different family altogether of flowering plants, not related to the sundews. So this is an example of that convergent evolution. Here we have another modified leaf that's modified to be sticky. The genus for the butterworts is Pinguicula. You've heard of a penguin? A penguin is so called because it's greasy. So pinguicula means little greaser, little greasy one, because the surface of the leaves is that sticky, viscous, oily texture. 
Ludia means yellow. You'll see why it gets the name yellow in just a second. But here we have the butterwort pinguicula ludia, our most prevalent of our butterworts here at Brooker. And the leaves are slightly different in this. It again exists as a basal rosette. That means it grows right at the surface of the ground. So a stumbling, bumbling insect could very easily walk onto these leaves. Another insect might land on the leaf and become inextricably stuck. Another insect might see a potential prey species stuck to the leaf come in to investigate and itself get stuck. So the surface of these leaves are very, very greasy and sticky. Another adaptation is the edges of the leaves. Perhaps you can see are curled upward. Can you see that? So that if, if a, if a, insect does manage to get its footing back and tries to walk to the edge of the leaf, it's just going to encounter basically a wall of this flypaper and game over. And you can see on this particular individual just the number of insects that are trapped on the leaf and slowly being absorbed. Here's the ludia part of Pinguicula lutea. Now the leaves themselves are kind of a yellowish green, but the flowers are a screaming yellow, bright chrome yellow. Um, not being able to photograph things very well. There's two here. So I've got one with the rosette in focus and then focus all the way up to the top of the flowering scape. And we have the great big yellow flower again, the strategy here is to separate the flower from the traps so as not to eat any pollinators. Quite clever. The pinguiculas. Pinguicula little greaser pumula means the little little greaser. So pinguicula pumula is a very tiny little butterwort here. These lines, these fibers that you see in the photograph are pine needles for scale. So you can see this thing is very small. This rosette, again, about the size of one of your fingernails. It's a little annual species. That means the seeds fall, rest, germinate in the spring, grow, flower, and then the whole plant dies away. So when we see this, we're always very glad um, because we know we're only going to see it for just one year. It's, a, it's an annual. The flowers on this one are white. And you know, I've, I haven't seen this one for a couple of years out here. We we had one year where there was quite a few in a, one of the sections of the um, trails. Haven't seen it as much since. The seeds, of course, can wait until the conditions are just right or just wrong. You know, conditions have to be just wrong enough for a carnivorous plant to, to come up and take hold because everything has to be bad for the carnivores to do well, right? The ability to outcompete comes when the nitrogen levels are limited, right? So those are the flypaper trappers. Now we have those species that use a suction. They actually slurp their prey into bladder structures. And that gives this group their name, the bladder wart, which is just a German way of saying the bladder plants. Wart in German is plant. So the bladder plants, the bladder warts. This group is in the genus Utricularia, and they tend to be mostly aquatic. The bladders are formed on their leaves, which are very often submerged. So the leaves are now under water, even more, even less exposure to sunlight when the leaves are underwater. So these, again, are trading off the ability to photosynthesize at the highest uh, capacity, at the highest efficiency, but they do have these bladders on the leaves that can suck in prey. They're very often found in great numbers in small ponds. Here is a small pond that we were interpreting uh, on video during 
during COVID, we wandered out into a, a small pond completely surrounded by bladder wart. And we're able to access these modified leaves to look at the bladders. So these little bladders, hollow bladders are microscopic and their prey is microscopic. The bladders are formed as three-dimensional air pockets. Well, they're not air pockets, they're vacuums. Three-dimensional little vacuums with a trigger hair at the opening. So that if any unwearing microscopic, you know, microinvertebrate in the water, like a, a water flea, Daphnia, or a nematode worm might be passing by and accidentally brush one of those trigger hairs, the vacuum is opened and the prey species is sucked in. And then the bladder can close itself and the plant, uh, the animal on the inside, the worm or the crustacean or the insect or the larva of whatever is slowly decomposed inside the bladders. There are a few terrestrial species and they do have those suction bladders. They just tend to grab those soil-borne critters, uh, much more nematode worms and some of the smaller springtail-like insects and, and such from the ground. This is the zigzag bladder wart on a very, very short wire-like stem with the leaves, again, underground doing the trapping. And finally, well, finally for, for Pinellas, the, or finally for Florida, the pitfall traps. And the pitfall traps belong to the pitcher plants. Now, when I say pitcher plant, I'm referring to the Saracenias in their own family, the Saraceniaceae. And they are the pitfall traps from North America. There are pitcher plants from Borneo, um, the Nepenthes group of flowering plants, which, you know, you can buy in a hanging basket, but they're not native here. They also have pitfall traps, but we're just going to interpret the ones that are native to the Southeast U.S. And in particular, the ones that are in Peninsular Florida, Saracidia, Minor. And we'll take a look at how they work their pitfall traps, which is quite interesting and unique. So we visited this um, these pitcher plants in April, and it was at a time when they were trading last year's leaves for this year's leaves. Each leaf forms this upright tube. So a leaf growing from the ground that's completely hollow, like a toilet paper tube, and then it's hooded on the top. So just imagine your toilet paper tube that has one side that's slightly longer and folds over the top. You can see a side view of that lid. Uh, we'll look at it. Uh, you can see perhaps the opening here. So this is a time of year in April, March and April, when last year's leaves are dying away. You know, they're just losing leaves. They're, they're losing last year's leaves and they're producing this year's leaves also in flower. So there's a race to flower and get pollinated and try not to swallow your own pollinators. Another view of a little patch of these Saracenia minor, which means the small Saracenia. And you might note the spots on what appears to be the back of the traps. If, if this were the front with the mouth open, here are those spots on the back side of that. And the way that these work is that here we are looking head on. An insect is going to land on this lip of that toilet paper tube. And there might be something very attractive being produced, some nectar-like substance, something sweet, something, you know, aromatic, something that is bringing the insects to land on this. Now they're sitting underneath the hood on this rim. And when they've had their fill of whatever they're licking or investigating, they're going to head towards the light to escape. So from the edge of this lip, 
the little insects are going to fly towards the light. And that light is shining through those thin areas of the leaf forming windows. But they're merely translucent. There's no way through those windows. And so the animal is going to fly and smack into the window and fall down into this tapered tube. Along the inside of the tapered tube is very slippery, waxy, with downward facing hairs that prevent that critter from being able to climb back out. It's pretty clever. It's a pretty good adaptation. I especially like the windows part. And you can kind of see how that would work time and time and time again. And once a bunch of animal bodies start piling up down here, they're going to start to stink a little bit. You know who loves the smell of dead animals is flies. They might land on this lip wondering where the stench is, you know, where's the party? They're going to land and then they get flown in. And so that's how it works. Here's our boss, Lara, being very excited, as we all were, to make this discovery of a patch of wild Saracenias. And this is kind of a Saracenias I view. Um, you can see their size, their scale. So this is Lara towering over the little Saracenia miners. I took the opportunity to remove one of last year's leaves and just investigate and see the slurry that is produced by those piles and piles and piles of trapped insects, spiders, um, anything that falls in there is fair game. Although the traps are really quote unquote designed to capture the smaller insects. And they turn into this wonderful um, decomposed mass. Now the fourth type of trap is a snap trap. And these, of course, are the most exciting. These are the ones with the teeth. These are the ones that move. These are the ones that catch, you know, lizards or whatever. These are clearly the world's best known carnivorous plant. And as I mentioned, they're not native to Florida. All they, though they are naturalized, they have got loose and they've established themselves where they can compete. Uh, their natural distribution is right here in North and South Carolina. The reason they're called Venus flytrap is, I remember reading when I was a kid, I guess this is still true, is that these plants are supposed to be found within a certain radius of a meteor crater. So the idea is that they came from outer space. It's not true. That's one of our myths that we're debunking today. They just adapted like all the other carnivorous plants. So the, the Venus fly traps are unique in that you can actually see the, the bladder warts move, but you can't really see them because they're, you can't see the bladders working because they're so small. The Venus fly traps actually move. They can see them. Uh, they have the same adaptations for the same reasons. They live in areas where the resources the nitrogen and phosphorus are limited. They have to outcompete in these terrible conditions. They have modified leaves and they've traded the ability to photosynthesize with the ability to trap food. And the way that they catch their food is by counting. Uh, these hairs, remember the hairs on the Drosera, the, the sundews? Uh, here's some modified hairs. These are actually thigmotaxic. So if two, or maybe it's three, uh, if one of these hairs is triggered, the trap doesn't close. If two of the hairs are triggered, the trap doesn't close. But when three hairs are triggered, there's an assurance that something worth catching has landed on and is sticking around on the surface of the leaf to warrant the trap coming shut. Um, the trap will reopen, I think, three times before it gives up and the leaf just turns black and rots away. Um, but while the trap is closed, we'll talk about digestion and how and why these carnivorous plants digest their prey. So remember the nitrogen cycle. With nitrogen moving through in a perfect world in balance and everything just moves 
keep that in mind with regard to the these decomposers, right? So we've got nitrogen in the environment and it's going through. Now we have these groups of bacteria and fungi that can decompose. They can take living things apart. They can take dead things apart. They can take living things apart, right? There's some bacterial diseases and there are some fungal diseases, aren't there? That's the these bacteria and fungi taking apart living tissue. So those organisms could certainly be considered pathogens to plants. Stick with me. So the plants, to protect themselves from these bacteria and fungus, have to synthesize their own antimicrobials. We call them spices. We can't get enough of these antibiotics that plants make for themselves. A lot of them are toxins, and a lot of those toxins end up as our spices. It's just one of the things that plants can do. They synthesize all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. Uh, we'll talk about how plants use um, what we call spices in their own defense tomorrow uh, at 2 o'clock. Um with spice science, and you can register for that through the Weedon Island Preserve. Uh, we're, we're being hosted by them to talk more about the spice. Anyway, so these compounds that plants synthesize to combat bacteria and fungus, and especially fungus, kind of led the way, kind of pre-adapted plants to being able to decompose insects. What? Okay. So plants have to protect themselves from fungus, fungal infection. Plants need a fungicide. Okay. And we all know fungus, the mushrooms. Did you know that fungus are made out of little hollow tubes called mycelium? What we see as a mushroom is the very end of the story. The majority of the story is going around and on underground and within the things that they're decomposing, these little hollow tubes called hyphae. Um, and it's the hyphae that secrete the digestive enzymes that break down living and dead matter. Well, hyphae, mycelium, mushrooms in that order are made of chitin. So fungus is made of chitin. Chitin is also what insects are made of because fungus is basically a, a prototype for animals. Fungus isn't a kind of plant or even closely related plants. It's kind of an animal. It's made of animal protein. It's made of chitin, just like insects. So plants, one of the fungicides that plants have come up with is an enzyme called chitinase that breaks chitin apart, thus deactivating a fungal pathogen. Do you see what I'm saying? So plants have a defensive mechanism called chitinase that it uses to kill fungus by taking it apart. So this chitinase could be co-opted to take apart insect bodies because insects are made of chitin as well. Isn't that cool? I think it's really cool. So hopefully mind is blown. We're coming up on time. Just as a reminder, this all idea of plant carnivory, plants have to be able to absorb nutrients from dead prey, from the surface or from the interior, but from some surface of itself. And it has to have at least one of the adaptations to lure, to catch, or digest its prey. There might be more carnivorous plants yet to be discovered that we just haven't ever noticed we're doing this. But they do have an adaptation to either lure or catch or digest or all of the above or some of the above. Their prey. 
So from the ground up, from the humble little sundew, we hope you'll come and visit some of our carnivorous plants here at Brooker Creek someday. Take a walk on our trails and look closely. Um, the closer you look, the slower you go, and the quieter you are, the more you will see. And sometimes it's the very, very, very small things that are the most fascinating and warrant the most attention. From the sticky traps to the bladders, to the gunk at the bottom of the pit, all these adaptations are ways that plants have to living in these compromised habitats. So I really appreciate your attention today. I'm going to open the q and It looks like we have a few questions in here. While I take a drink of water and get myself together, would you mind filling out a quick poll for us? We like to take the temperature of our audiences and we're always looking to improve our presentation. So let me just get a drink of water and I'll get to your questions. So our first question, why are these plants sometimes referred to as predatory and sometimes as carnivorous? I can add one to that. Sometimes these plants are referred to as insectivorous, um, with the idea there being that these plants are only adapted to being insectivorous and only eating insects. Um, it just depends on the speaker or the author as to how these things are referred to. Uh, predatory might suggest a little bit more of an active role in pursuing prey. So a predator might be more of a mobile organism, an animal that can actually chase its prey down. Whereas carnivorous or insectivorous just um, refers to the fact that they can uh, take and break down animal tissue, be it insect or otherwise. Um, thank you, thank you. Do any of the predatory plants eat geckos and not caterpillars? Now, these predatory plants that we've looked at, and that's a great question, these are all designed, again, or modified to lure, catch, and or digest their prey. The lure, like I said, could be a primary lure, just a bright, shiny surface, like the sundews, that might attract one type of insect. Once the insect is stuck, something else might come in and see their prey stuck down, and they go to eat it, and then they themselves get stuck. So oftentimes what ends up in the trap might not have been what was originally intended to be in the trap. So an example here on this slide, we have the Venus fly trap. It's already trapped this fly. It's either the fly died and didn't get digested or whatever. We have this fly carcass on an open Venus fly trap leaf. A gecko, like your example, might come along and see a fly and just instinctively and reactively go and put its face in there to grab that fly, thinking that it's still alive. The presence of that gecko's face might be enough to trigger the hairs to cause the trap to close on the gecko. And if the trap is strong enough, the gecko is not going anywhere. So then the gecko is then going to quote unquote eat that gecko. Once the gecko is dead, the the enzymes are then able to slowly, slowly, slowly take the gecko apart. Also, the atmospheric or the environmental bacteria that are just simple agents of decay are going to start turning that gecko into a soup that the plant could take advantage of. As far as caterpillars are concerned, non-discriminatory. Anything that wanders into, onto one of these four different kinds of traps, as long as it can be trapped, will become food. So I hope that's a good enough answer for your question. And yeah, the snap trap, as I just mentioned, could grab 
It would, however, if the caterpillar happened to trigger the hairs in just the right sequence, the caterpillar is going to be food as well. So great. I'm really thankful that y'all joined us today. That looks like it's it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Uh, and do tune in next month for epiphytes. We'll talk about another group of plants that have adapted to an environment and made the most of kind of a bad situation. Those plants that grow on, not in, but on the real estate provided by our larger trees, the epiphytic plants. So thank you again, and we will hopefully see you next month, if not sooner.